Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April and I am back today with a study. Uh, so we're going to do the fear of the Lord today. That's a big one actually. So um, I hope I can do this justice. I'm going to do my best. Uh, but the last video that I posted was um, a little bit of a train wreck. I don't even know how I allowed myself to post that on <laughs> the video with me and my kids. Um, so the goal was for them to, you know, I've been telling them for days to come up with questions for this video. Well, they never did. And then, you know, so we had to make it happen at some point. And I thought, well, maybe they'll come up with questions while we're talking, but kind of turned into just I don't know, discussions about everything under the sun, starting with, uh, I don't know what it started with, but it was like uh, biology, uh, evolution, you know, uh, how conservative I am. It's like, I don't think anyone watching uh, was shocked at all to know that I'm conservative. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm a creationist. I believe in creation and all that. So I don't think those were much of a shock, but there were some things that were maybe kind of shocking in there. I don't know. It was a mess. We'll just say that. Um, so I did edit it, but I think I was in a hurry and I didn't, I probably should have edited a lot more out. And I don't know how it became almost an hour. Um, I really don't but it's weird when you edit sometimes you you think you edit a ton and it only edits out a couple of minutes so editing really is can be a long thing so anyway and my boys did not watch it to tell me you know kind of what they thought or help me edit it or watch it before we post it or anything they were just like whatever I don't think they're even gonna watch it because to them that's way too long. They would never watch, you know, a video that's that long. So I showed them portions of it and of course they laughed, but. So anyway, uh, I, it does seem like I'm a little, uh, what do you call it? I'm a little, I come on a little strong with them, but they're my kids and who else? I'm probably the only person that could do that with them and it's okay. I mean, it doesn't bother them. So, um, so yes, I do, I do make sure that they know, you know, the basics. I mean, I wish we could go a lot deeper and a lot further, but I'm not gonna push them to that. You know, they have to kind of do that on their own. No one can really do that for you. If you wanna have a deeper relationship with God, it has to be something that comes totally from you. But I want them to know, absolutely know the basics. And especially if we believe that um, Jesus is coming is imminent. I want that to be, you know, on the top of their mind all the time. I want them to be thinking about that. I want them to think that way. And we should do that for everyone that we love that's in our life. You know, we should want them to, you know, um, be with us, come with us whenever, uh, Jesus returns. So, you know, why wouldn't I do that? So of course they roll their eyes. They think it's funny because yes, mom, we know, you know, they do know all the basics. They, they know even more than that, but they probably know more than I think they know. But I want that to be, uh, I want them to be thinking about that often. I don't want that to be far from their thoughts process, you know. Um, so, what else was I going to say about that video? Oh, so you can't take to heart everything that you saw in that video because uh, sometimes we say things just to kind of get a rise out of the other person. Uh, case in point, um, you know, it was funny when I <laughs> said... All the Christians say to use DuckDuckGo and to hear Wesley's response to that. Why would you use DuckDuckGo? Um, I've actually only used that maybe once. Um, I literally Google everything. So, you know, um, anyway, so if anyone wants to know the reality of anything that happened in that video, just ask me. I will tell you, but 
Uh, so I wish they would have written down questions that they really wanted to know the answers to and ask me, but no, you know, so that's kind of how it goes. You know, you can't, you can't really plan these things or you try to plan them and they don't pan out. So I guess that's how it goes. I thought they would ask me kind of like, um, you know, what music do you listen to? Cause well, I mean, they know that I listen to mostly Christian music. I mean, I don't have lots of time to be listening to music, first of all, but um, one time I was listening to other stuff and Wesley said, I didn't know you liked, you know, Ed Sheeran or whatever it was. And I'm like, yeah, I listen to a lot of other stuff. I like Adele, you know, I, there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, Bruno Mars. I, I like a lot of other music. Uh, but it's mostly kind of ballads. I mean, I'm not really, it, I, I listen to kind of soft ballad type music, but, um, so yesterday I had my hair done and it's a little dark. I'm, I'm going, oh my gosh, it's, it's a little darker than what I like, but thankfully it's just, it's what they call a glaze they put on. So it'll it'll fade probably within a few weeks so anyway so what is the fear of the Lord um, a lot of people hear that and they're like oh wow I'm supposed to be afraid of God you know I have to be afraid and it and no that's not it you don't have to be afraid of God um, so if you think of him as your parent a good parent then no, you wouldn't be afraid of him. The fear of the Lord is a reverential fear um, of an infinite majesty, a greatness, something that is, you know, it, it's, 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 it's an awe of, you know, the holiness of, of God. So that is something that our society kind of doesn't really... I've just noticed in the, you know, younger generations that they don't really understand what reverence is. Um, it's like people don't really um, um, have reverence for much. Um, and somebody was asking me the other day, um, they were like, well, why, uh, you know, if God was just a person like us, um, you know, uh, then how can we want to worship them and I'm going huh like there's this con there's no concept of something being above superior you know and holy and I don't know how to bridge that gap I don't know what the problem is why that's not there okay so the fear of the Lord is based in a revelation of his nature his purposes and his power um, the fear of the Lord is a profound love and deep respect for God. So it's, it's an awe and, and it's a reverence. To fear God is to approach him with reverence and an awe. So Psalm 89, 7. Let's look that up. I, I can't find my go-to Bible. I don't even know where it is. I, I think it's in where I, I have another little curio thing where I have all my Bibles and devotionals in there. I think it's in there. Let's hope. So today I have the Everyday Life Bible, Joyce Meyer, Amplified Version. And here's my famous last words. Uh, <laughs> this video is not going to be real long. Uh, I, I don't know how many times I've said that and I'll, like I'll, I'll re-watch my videos and I'm going I can't believe I said that in the beginning of the video and this is like 45 minutes to an hour, you know, so I, I always try, but okay, 89, seven. Um, okay, this is the Amplified. God greatly feared and revered in the council of the holy ones and to be feared and worshiped, revered above all those who are round about him. So, I, uh, or we have to have reverence for some things in our, in life, you know, I mean, 
um, there's always something that's kind of higher above that's got authority. And I was thinking, well, what do people revere today? And the sad, the sad thing is that a lot of people revere fame, you know, fame and fortune. So they will revere famous people. Like if you see a famous person, you know, then you're just like in awe, oh my gosh, you know, that person's famous. But what, but they're not, it just, it's not, it's not like fearing God because God actually has all the power and all the might and, you know, everything, all the love and everything. This other person doesn't have that for you, you know? Um, so what else would we revere? Something that is rare or that was not seen often. So people will have awe for like, I don't know, a new species of fish or something, you know, or, or a rare coin that was found in a treasure, you know, something like that. And so I think one of the problems is that we can't see God. So we don't understand uh, how big he is. We don't understand how we need to reverence him. And um, so when you have reverence for God, Am I getting ahead of myself? Okay, so we have reverence for God. You're going to want to uh, worship him. So worshiping God is a form of, of reverence and awe. So, um, you know, I, I noticed this with my kids. They were complaining one time because, well, in our church service, the, the you know, the, the music, I just, it just seems like, redundant and they always have the same they're always playing the same three chords and whatever it all sounds the same is what they're saying and I'm like well guys this is not like your your concert that you go to you know where they're trying to put on this show and have all this you know it's it's worship I said it that it's worship music so yeah some of it is repetitive it's you know whatever but you're supposed to be worshiping so if you're, if you're thinking about God and, you're, and your focus is on him, then it doesn't matter if it's repetitive or what, you're, you're doing this for him. You're thinking about him. And so they were kind of like, oh yeah, I guess like there's a difference, you know, in just any old song or uh, a good song or, or something in a concert versus worshiping God. That's its own thing. You know, we're here to worship. So that's why someone's praying and, and you know, the, the worship leader is trying to lead us in worship, which is something that prepares our hearts for the message. Because it's like, what are we seeing all this for? You know, well, it's preparing us. It's preparing our hearts and softening our hearts so that whenever the pastor preaches, this will, you know, be able to impact us in some way. So for an unbeliever, um, the, they might have a fear of God in the way of fearing that he um, will have some kind of judgment and, and, you know, that he will be judging them and possible and that they will possibly, you know, have eternal death or something that they're, they're not going to please God or whatever. But if you're a believer and you understand God, you understand that he's good and and you and you know who he is the fear is more a reverence and awe you're not afraid so if you're afraid um you might be afraid of like a tyrant or you know a dictator people are afraid of those type of people because it's like oh if i have one misstep this person's gonna you know cut me down or cut me out or whatever cut me off um but god is not a tyrant we're not we're not afraid of God. The fear is an overwhelming awe, respect, and reverence that we have because he is so high above and so far above, and he's the creator of everything, the universe. It, the, I, I wish I could somehow get the word out of, of what this holiness is. When something is holy it's like it's like when you're you're vacationing somewhere and you go into a church it's like all of a sudden you just feel like wow you know we kind of have to be quiet in here and it's just it's spiritual and 
you know, you, you kind of feel some kind of holiness, some kind of reverence, some kind of awe just for the building. Some of these buildings are beautiful and, you know, and there's a lot, a lot to see in there. So, but we don't um, revere a building. We revere the God of the universe who is above everything. So, I was reading in here how, how heaven worships God in one of these articles up here that I pulled up. Okay, so there is this Bible verse, okay, Revelation 5.12. I think there was one in Isaiah. That's the one I was trying to find, but... Okay. So we'll go to verse 11. So when you see God as a king, okay, he's a king. So so think about if you were ever to go into, I don't know, some kingdom somewhere. I, <laughs> uh, I've never been to England, but, you know, um, if you were to go to somewhere like that where there's a king and a queen, he would have a reverence and a, an awe and a respect for them if you were to go in and see the thrones and all of, all of the pomp and circumstance and you know all all the rituals and the things so um so jesus is the king and i had done a video where i had said he's the king of king and lord of lords above all other kings so imagine how much reverence you would have for a king or a queen like the Queen of England who just passed away. Uh, you know, everybody wanted to meet her. They were in, re in awe of her. You know, she reigned for uh, longer than any monarch had ever reigned. Um, so imagine, you know, people trying to meet her and how in awe of, of her they were. So, so God is way above all of that. Um, you know, if you've ever gotten a, a traffic ticket and had to go to court, you know, and you're, and you have to go before a judge, I mean, you kind of like, you know, you, you have to uh, mind your P's and Q's when you're in front of a judge, you're not going to act like an idiot or act stupid or start cracking jokes, you know, it's, it's that, it's like that person has power and authority. So the judge has power and authority to either get you out of your ticket or make you pay more, whatever, you know, I don't know. He has things he can do. So, so someone that has more power and authority than us is what we're going to reverence and, and be in awe of. Think about it as like a, a queen, a king, or a judge, or something like that. Um, and that is the reverence and awe that you have. So you're not afraid. I mean, you might be afraid if you're in front of a judge and, and, you know, you're trying to get out of something, but, um, with God, you're not afraid, uh, especially if you're a Christian, you're not afraid that he is going to, you know, bring the gavel down on you, condemn you, whatever. Um, you're in reverence and awe of his goodness, his graciousness, his mercy, all of those things that flow out of him. So, um, this scripture in Revelation is talking about how the how heaven worships God. So Revelation 5, 11 and on. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels on every side of the throne and of the living creatures and the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin. And they numbered 10,000 times 10,000 in heaven and on earth and under the earth in Hades, the place of departed spirits, and on the sea, and all that is in it, crying out together, to him who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb, be ascribed the blessing, and the honor, and the majesty, glory, and splendor, and the power, might, and dominion, forever and ever, through the eternities of the eternities. So, and there's people that have gone to heaven, um, and, and come back, um, there's a lot of people that I watch, um, some of the, a couple of the prophets, you know, things like that, or, or even 
someone that that God just sends back to the earth because they still have things to do. They still have a message for us. Um, they talk about how majestic it is in heaven and how you are in awe. I mean, everything is just, it's just, it, it's so much more amazing than any amazing thing could ever be down here, you know? And, um, Few people have seen the throne room, but there is a throne room in heaven. And so imagine all the angels around the heavenly throne room. So if you were in an earthly throne room, you would be in awe. You would be, <laughs> you know, if you went to the coronation of the king, I think it's Charles, uh, you, you would be, you know, it would be a pretty amazing, awesome experience. So think about the throne room in heaven where the angels you know, the angels are already holy um, because God created them that way. Um, they don't have, uh, um, you know, a will like we do, but they are holy and they do worship God. So this verse is saying, um, verse, okay, let's read this again. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels on every side of the throne and of the living creatures and the elders, and they numbered 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. I did, I did skip over a verse, saying in a loud voice, deserving is the lamb who was sacrificed. Jesus Christ is the lamb who was sacrificed, which is why we don't have animal sacrifices anymore. Okay, he, he was the ultimate sacrifice, the last sacrifice ever needed so we call him the lamb deserving is the lamb who was sacrificed to receive all the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and majesty glory and splendor and blessing and I heard every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in it crying out together so all of these creatures in heaven uh, well, it says on earth too. This is a vision, you know, this is revelation. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, crying out together to him who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. So he who is seated on the throne is God, the father, and the lamb is Jesus Christ. Be ascribed the blessing and the honor and the majesty, glory and splendor and the power might and dominion forever and ever through etern the eternities of eternities. Um, so this is referencing a scripture in Daniel. Maybe we should look that up because um, you know there was, a, there was an Old Testament scripture uh, that was talking about this same thing. <clears throat> so Daniel 7 video just as a little side note here has been a struggle because um first of all I spilled something on my shirt then I came in here to to do this study to study a little bit for this and um it's a long story but I ended up spilling all of my coffee that I had just made I think I had like one sip two sips left it was everywhere. It was on my keyboard. I had to get my son's laptop up, all these books. Now one of the books has coffee and everything is sticky now. It was just, I, I don't know, not a fun experience. So that took me a long time to clean that up before I can even start this. So now I'm like, oh, my mind is just, uh, wait a second. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions and behold on the clouds of the heavens come one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, pass away and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. So, so if you were to go to an earthly kingdom here, you know, it would be a country, um, however big the country is that you would go to, uh, but 
God's kingdom is everything, you know, the whole world, the, everything, the universe. Um, that's his kingdom. So how much more reverent should we be? How much more in awe of him should we be? Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about, well, what is reverence? What is sacred? Because I think that in the day and time that we live, not a whole lot is reverent or, or not. People are just not reverent about a whole lot. And there's nothing really sacred anymore. I mean, if you just watch a lot of the uh, commercials that are on TV about things, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, back, back when, when my grandparents were alive, they would have never talked about anything like this, especially in a commercial. You know, it's like there's nothing sacred anymore. So I think that's part of why people don't understand reverence. They don't understand how to be reverent and, 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 and what something holy means and sacred. Because there are things that are sacred in life. And, um, and nowadays people just, everything is like throw away, you know, I can just throw this away. I can throw my friendships away and get another friend. I can, you know, throw people in and out of my life, you know, and, and everything is like disposable, you know, uh, that's how jobs are now. It's like, well, if, 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 you know, they get rid of me, I can get a job on the other side of, of the country, you know, I'll find something. Um, it's just, it's just kind of, that's the way it is. But, um, that's, that's teaching us that, that, that nothing is constant. Nothing is, um, worth it. Nothing is in, and that's the thing with God. He's worthy. He is worthy because of who he is, what he's done for us, how he redeemed us, all of those things. He's worthy of our reverence and our awe and our respect. And so that's what we do in worship um, at church, what we should be doing. Oh, here's another scripture about, um, this is the one in Isaiah I was looking for, Isaiah 6.3. So uh, here it is in two different translations. So the English Standard Version says, not helpful, Okay, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Um, so that is what happens at the throne of God. Okay, those creatures, who you know, the angels, whatever creatures are up there, um, there's things that we don't, we've never seen before up there, you know, uh, but they're all around the throne, worshiping God nonstop, telling him how great he is, how wonderful he is. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And what that means is when God says, I am in the Old Testament, uh, that means he always was, he is, and he always will be. We can't understand that with our finite minds. There's another thing we can't understand. Um, so how was God always here? How How is he always, you know, how was he always there? I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. Um, but I know that he is, he was. And so that's why he says in his word, I am that I am. So, um, there is no higher being. There is no higher being than that. So that's why all these creatures, the angels, they're continually worshiping him. They're paying him homage, you know, um, for the, just because he is so amazing. So like I wrote a devotion on Moses. Well, my sequel devotion was called The Cleft of the Rock. And I think I forgot to write in there how, um, you know, so, so the reason that, uh, in, in, in that part of the Bible, when, when Moses was up on the Mount, why he went, God put him in the cleft of the rock is because he was going to walk by him. So Moses was not able to see, um, 
we cannot, uh, how do you explain this? We cannot handle how amazingly powerful and, and holy God is. We can't handle it. So God had to put him in the cleft of the rock so that when he walked by, it wouldn't just completely overwhelm and overpower him. I mean, if you've seen anybody ever fall down in a service, I know a lot of people think that that is, you know, hooey or, or it's fake. Um, some of them are, I mean, you can fake anything, but it's happened to me before and I'm not one to fake things. You know, I don't, I'm not into that. I, I, why, you know, but if you understood the power that God has, and when he gives someone else that power, like this um, video that I just did on the anointing, so that is God giving part of his power to someone, a vessel to use for him. So if you're ever in a service and uh, someone had that power uh, on them or in them or on their hands or whatever, God gives his power to certain people, depending, you know, uh, and you felt it, you, you, you could fall out because the power of God is, uh, uh, you can't withstand it. Our bodies cannot withstand it. That's how strong it is. And so, um, I've seen that happen so many times and, um, you just can't, you cannot withstand his power. Um, because we're human, he's not, you know, he's deity. And, um, what was I going to say that goes along with that? Uh, I thought maybe we should read that part in Moses where, uh, this happened. Okay. Okay, so God places Moses in the cleft of the rock and covered Moses until he passed by so that Moses would see only the backside of God. So, um, the glory of Moses being placed in the cleft of the rock to see the glory of God. This is what God said to Moses, okay, in Exodus 33, 21 through 23. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Um, and, and that goes to show how we just cannot stand up under the power of God. So Moses, okay, Moses was a powerful man of God. I, one of my pet peeves is when people say, oh, well, men wrote the Bible. It's just, okay. Yeah. Yeah. A very powerful chosen man of God. You know, those are the type of people that wrote the Bible. It wasn't like your, you know, your neighbor down the street just woke up one day and oh, decided to write something. No, these are chosen men of God that, and that's why when I did my Moses um, devotion, it was called Moses, man of God's power. That was a clue that I'm telling you, this person is a powerful man of God. Okay. That's why he could write the first five books of the Bible, you know, um, and, and God inspired him to write that God wrote it through him. He actually wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger and the only person that received those Ten Commandments was Moses, okay? The person that stood in front of the burning bush. And here's the thing, the bush was not consumed with fire, okay? So God did all these things in front of Moses. God, God did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle with Moses. Moses was an amazing, powerful man of God, chosen to write. Um, and if you look at the New Testament and Paul, okay, Paul, <laughs> no one, no one can, can come close to Paul. Okay. So he, these men that wrote the Bible were anointed to do it. So you can look at my anointing video. They were not only called, chosen, anointed, everything to do what they did. 
uh, I mean, you, it just, it, it's just, it's pretty amazing. So these people are saying that, you know, if Moses were to see God in all his glory, it would have meant instantaneous annihilation to him. Because like I said, uh, God's power and his glory, the glory that is around him and his splendor is so powerful. We can't look upon it. We can hardly feel it. So if you... If you are in a service where someone has that power coming out of them and touches you and you fall under it, imagine that's just, that's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of God's power. Um, and you can't even handle that. So there's no way. So God's like, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. So, and, and he also put his hand over it. I mean, that's how powerful it is, guys. So he's walking by uh, and Moses gets to glimpse his back. Um, we're not going to look into whether he looked at his face or not. We can do that another time. Um, I think that's in there somewhere. But what I'm trying to drive home today is the fact that um, this 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 thing about God being so holy and powerful and mighty. Okay, so. Um, so that's what, oh, I guess we'll just leave that as to that's what reverence is. Um, so we're not afraid of God. So why do we want to fear God? Why do we want to have this reverence and offer him? It's because it takes us out of ourselves and it puts our um, thoughts on God. And now we, if our thoughts are off of ourselves and onto him, we want to please him. Um, I often tell people that feel, uh, depressed, um, and I preach, preach in the choir because it happens to me a lot, but, uh, so the best thing that you can do is get your thoughts off of you onto someone else, like onto someone else that is in need, or someone that has it worse than you do, or, you know, um, something that where you can maybe fill a need and you can focus you, you get your your view off of your problems over here because the more we look at our problems the bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger they seem you know they're not getting smaller they look like they're getting bigger um, but we got to take our focus away from that okay so so oftentimes when I pray with someone I'll say put that at Jesus's feet you know you lay that at the feet of the cross why? Because the cross is the symbol of what God did. It's a symbol of redemption. It's a symbol of the fact that Christ is going to carry this burden for you, right? So what, what happened on the cross? It was when, um, um, you know, all this physical stuff happened to Jesus where they whipped him and all that. But the point of the cross was for him to take on the whole sin of the world because he is the ultimate sacrifice, the, the, the last sacrifice ever needed, um, the lamb. But in order to redeem us, he had to take on the sins of the world. So all the burdens um, that, that, that everyone in the world had at the time, everyone could ever have, he takes on those burdens. So I tell people, um, lay it at the foot of the cross. Now, if you do that, you have to leave it there. And that's the hard part um, because it's easy for us to take it back. Now I'm going to run back up there and I'm going to grab that burden. I'm going to start worrying about it again. You know, I'm, I, I can't stop. You know, I, this problem is so big. No one can help me. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you that every problem that you have is a problem that's known to man, that everybody, someone has dealt with from here to, you know, from uh, the beginning of time. You know, there's no new problems, is what I'm trying to say. Like when I was in English class, uh, they were like, there's no new words. You know, everything's already been written. So everything that you write is going to be kind of in some way a copy of someone else because there's nothing new to write. There's no, there's no problems that are new that, um, I mean, I guess there could be if, you know, there's exceptions, if, if, if there's a new invention or something and there's a new problem. But what I'm saying is problems that men have, 
um, they're they're pretty much all have have are out there already, and God has 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 dealt with and helped and picked up every problem, every burden that we could ever have. Now, where was I going with that thought? Um, so you leave it at the cross. What was I saying? What was I going to say after that? Uh, oh, so um, the point of getting our uh, focus off of ourselves and our problems is so that we can focus on God. So in that case, I was saying, you know, uh, if you're feeling down, depressed, you can take the focus off yourself, go help someone else, and that helps. But in this, um, for this study, we're talking about why would we want to fear God? We want to fear Him and, and understand uh, how holy He is and revere Him because uh, it takes our focus off of us and puts it on Him and how we can please Him. Okay, so it leads us to love him. Because if I just say we focus on pleasing him, then that sounds like works again. What it does is it takes our focus off of us onto who he is, and we fall more and more in love with who he is. So again, I'm talking about a good parent, the best parent you could ever think of, okay? God is good. So um, if... if God is good and everything he does for us is good and everything is out of love and mercy and goodness and all those things righteousness then how can we not love that okay um, it's just like people in our lives we don't we don't want to be friends with someone that is you know a liar and a cheat and all these things and you know uh, we're not gonna love that person it's just I'm sorry you, you're not gonna love someone that is um doesn't have any integrity and you know um doesn't do what they say they're gonna do you know all of that so if god is all of that if we love if we love people that are that way you know we want those type of people in our lives those are the friends we want you know those are the kind of spouses we want those we want our children to be that way you know um if that's what we want as far as people then why would we not love God? Because God is all of that and more. We can't even fathom how amazingly awesome he is. Think about the most amazing person that you know. And, I mean, you know, and it's he's infinitely more than that. So, so what this is saying is that it leads us to love him. And out of love, like I was saying before in my other teachings, is that... Um, out of love is how we want to please him so again we're not pleasing him because we have to uh, and if we don't he's going to do something bad to us like a tyrant no we want to please him because we love him so it's just like our children you know they want to please us they're not afraid i mean my children are not afraid of me you know, but they do, they want to please me, you know, and that's because I'm their mother and, you know, all of that. Um, so, so do you see what I mean? There's a difference there. So we're not going to think about it in the works in the way of the works and the have tos. Um, so the more that we reverence God, the more that we see how awesome he is, the more we will fall in love with him and the more we will want to please him. That's why most more devoted Christians are doing more things because um, their love has gotten here and here and here and they see how, how amazing God is, you know, and, 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 and the more they get to know him, the better he is and the better he is and the more they want to do, you know. So it's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of it. Um, so when you fall in love with him, it moves you to do his will. So, um, when you fall in love with God, you're going to want to worship him and it's going to lead you to want to do his will in your life. Okay. Let's see what else we have. As usual, my notes are all over the place. I really need to do an outline so that I don't get mixed up. 
a God greatly feared and revered in the council of the holy ones, and to be feared and worshipfully revered above all those who are round about him. So before that it says, For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the mighty can be likened to the Lord? There is none. Okay, so that's Psalm 897, Proverbs 14, 27. I really would like to do a study on my dining room table again so I can have all my little books spread out. <laughs> um, but I have to wait until there's no one here. Uh, maybe in a week or two. All right, 89.7. So, um, no, that was Psalms, Proverbs 14.27. So we are going out of town again because it is fall break. So the kids are off of school Thursday, Friday, and I think Monday. I'm not sure if they're off Monday. Um, so we're taking a quick trip to Texas once again. Okay, um, 14.6. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Go from the presence of a foolish and self-confident man, for you will not find knowledge on his lips. The wisdom, which is comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, of the prudent. The wisdom of the prudent, prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is to deceive. So they're saying this because of this famous verse that talks about how um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So that was the second part of what I was going to talk about here. Um... Okay, Romans 2, 5 through 9. Things are falling out here. Romans 2. Alright. These are not the best glasses. I think this is my old prescription, so doing the best we can here. Alright. But by your callous stubbornness and impenitence of heart, you are storing up wrath and indignation for yourself on the day of wrath and indignation when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. This doesn't sound like the best scripture for right now. For he will render to every man according to his works as his deeds deserve. Now, why did I write this scripture down? To those who by patient persistence and well-doing uh, seek glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and self-willed and disobedient to the truth but responsive to wickedness, there will be indignation and wrath. So, okay. So that was talking about the fear, like like, like being afraid, being afraid of God's wrath. If you're a Christian, you're following Christ, you're not afraid of God's wrath. Yes, we're all going to be judged, but, um, you know, hopefully we're not going to be like this, the self-seeking person and all of that. If we're following Christ, right? So we're going to be um, under God's righteous judgment. Okay, what's next? So it, 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 it's a healthy fear as far as like, we don't want to cause him grief. We don't want to let him down. We don't want to let God down. Um, and that's why I was talking about um, you know, a, a father and a child because the child, the child wants to please the parent and doesn't want to let the parent down. That's the type of fear. It's not, it's not fear like uh, being afraid, like of a, of a tyrant. Um, so Deuteronomy 10, let me just look this up in here. Fear the Lord, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So that is what um, God asks of us, to fear him, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve him. Um, and then Proverbs 8.13 I think it's talking about how, what, what it is to be reverent and to hate evil. The reverent fear and worshipful awe of the Lord. Okay, so verse 12. 
I, wisdom from God, make prudence my dwelling, and I find out knowledge and discretion, the reverent fear and worshipful awe of the Lord includes the hatred of evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and perverted and twisted speech. I have counsel and sound knowledge. I have understanding. I have might and power. So it's just it's just showing the difference between, you know, what you're going to love and what you're going to hate. You're going to hate evil if you are, you know, fearing God in the right way. Um, okay, so I had Psalm 130, verse 3 through 4. If you, Lord, should keep account of and treat us according to our sins, O Lord, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you that you may be reverently feared and worshipped. So if our sins were not being forgiven, you know, then um, we, we could not stand before God, you know, um, basically. Uh, okay, so there's forgiveness in him. That's part of his goodness. You know, that's part of the thing that we're going to love. Um, and how we're going to fall in love with him. Um, so what I wanted to, a point that I wanted to make is, is, is awareness. So we all need to be aware. Um, I mean, we all need to be aware of a lot of things like, uh, you know, self-awareness is a big thing and people sometimes will say, oh, so-and-so are not very self-aware, you know. Um, so we need to kind of be God-aware. We need to be aware of where we are spiritually. Um, and, and that awareness is what's going to draw us to understand God's uh, holiness and to be able to revere Him, honor Him, respect Him. And... Um, so what I was reading earlier is that this awareness comes from when, when, when the Holy Spirit indwells us. So, um, so when you receive Christ, you know, you, the Holy Spirit does come in at that time. Um, and so, I mean, it depends on what you believe as far as do you believe if you, you know, that you're, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit or not or whatever. But I think there's no way the Holy Spirit couldn't come because when you receive Christ, you receive, you know, God and God is in three persons. So, but the Holy Spirit is what transforms us to give us that awareness that we need spiritually. So I, I believe that's just a personal belief of mine. You need to be aware spiritually. And that is how we can kind of wake up, you know. I mean, we all need to be aware of a lot of things. We need to be emotionally aware. We need to be aware of where we are in, in, in everything, every aspect of life. But let's wake up and be aware spiritually. Um, especially if we're calling ourselves children of God. We're calling ourselves Christ followers, you know. So, so what does that mean? We need we need to wake up and see what that means, and you know, be doers of the word. That's a whole nother video. But um, if you're just a hearer of the word and not a doer, then it's just kind of futile. You, if you're hearing the word, so hearing the word is like sermons, preaching, you know, teaching, kind of like what I'm doing now. If you hear the word, you got to put it into action. So you don't want to just be a hearer of the word. You want to be a doer of the word. So if I hear the preacher saying, you know, that uh, I need to have this reverence and all for God, then I need to awaken spiritually. I need to be have this awareness to the fact of who God is. So when I come into a church, you know, I'm going to be reverent. I'm going to be respectful. I'm going to be 
in awe, you know. And for me, it just happens naturally uh, in worship. I just, uh, uh, that is one of my favorite parts of the service. Anyone that knows me is like, okay, don't make her late for church because <laughs> she doesn't want to miss the music. Um, me, that's my, I, that's maybe my favorite part because we're worshiping God and we're giving him, uh, we're paying him homage for all that he's done for everyone on the earth. Think about all these 7 million people out there. Uh, God takes care of everyone. I don't know how he keeps track. I really don't. I mean, that's how amazing he is. And if you don't think that God's doing anything for you, you you're mistaken. Because he's at least providing air for you to breathe. You know, I mean, none of us would be here without God. We wouldn't have anything we have without God. We wouldn't um, be able to do anything without him. You know, and, and we're mad if things aren't perfect in our life. Well, how come I have this problem or that problem? But look at all the things that God is doing for you. Um, so, so yeah, so I don't like to miss the, the, the singing, the worship. I, I want to be seated at our church. You can get coffee and all these things. And I'm like, I need all of that done beforehand so I can be in my seat with my tea or whatever. Um, before the music starts and they have a countdown so that makes it easier for me but um, so anyway I think that is all I had uh, oh so the main thing okay so the main thing that we want to have this awareness right and the reason that um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom uh, because if we don't revere him, if we don't have reverence and awe for him, we will not take sin seriously. That was the main point um, that was that was made that I was seeing when I was um, kind of studying for this. We will not take sin seriously. So, uh, yeah, I need to do a video on sin. What is sin? You know, uh, but uh, it, it's it's things that are unclean so you don't want to have things that are unclean in the midst in, in his in the midst of an uh, of an almighty all-powerful God holy God so that's basically all it is but if we don't have the awareness and we don't revere him we're not going to take sin seriously and we, we really need to so um, I think that was all I had for today. Uh, and thanks you guys for watching and famous last words. Uh, this isn't going to be very long and I'm looking at this and I at least talked for an hour. So <laughs> maybe on my trip I can be um, editing this and hopefully I edit out more than just a few minutes. It's kind of hard to edit. Um, 15 minutes out of a video that's a lot but um i will do my best so all right guys um we will uh see each other in the next video